Hello and welcome to the Ahaki Podcasts as we continue to take a deep dive into everything health and everything African. My name is Solomon Serwanja. On this episode, I am really, what can I say, excited <laughs> to be hosting someone I call a friend, someone who is a giant in her space, someone who has seen and supported young people to grow into maturity and to take up their youth. Today on on this podcast, I am happy to be hosting Dr. Sabrina Chitaka, who is a celebrated pediatrician. She's also an adolescent medicine specialist. She wears very many hats. She's also a teacher, or you can say lecturer, and she teaches medicine and pediatrics. All right, Dr. Sabrina, thank you very much for making time for us today. And I am super excited to have you today. Uh, thank you, Solomon. I'm also excited to be here at your amazing space. I am truly delighted. Thank you, Dr. Sab. Dr. Sab, today I wanted us to talk about um, young people and sexuality or sexual reproductive health for young people and indeed the youth. Mm -hmm. I'm privileged to be a father of two girls and two boys. They're growing so fast. In fact, one is just finished P7. She's going to senior one. And with that is a reality that children grow and, you know, everything, the body changes. Um, they become sexually active. They become, everything else changes. And while I was just there, I was just remembering what it took me to grow up with my mother and my grandmother at that time who would in a way find ways of telling me you know what now solo kuze chinone chinone chino obolumu sometimes they would just send me to my uncle and they would tell me that and so i wouldn't find everything a surprise but it's different now um that many many parents right now are dot com parents i don't know if i should say that but we don't find it very open to speak to our young people about their sexual sexuality and sexual productive health. And eventually we leave it to matrons, senior women, and everyone else to talk to them about that. What though is very revealing are the numbers, the teenage pregnancies. We just there's a report that has been published by the Ministry of Health and other civil society organizations that portrayed a very, very high teenage pregnancy in Uganda. I've been having a privilege, Dr. Sabo, going out of this city and going to the villages. When you listen to the stories of these young people, sometimes it's their first time to have sex. They don't know what to do. They don't even know where to start from, but boom, they just find themselves pregnant. They don't know what to do. Some of them then end up doing crude abortions and that results into pain. You a mother, you a pediatrician, you, a, you work with young people. Would love to hear your story on the state of sexual productive health for young people in Uganda. Dr. Sab, you're welcome. Um, thank you so much, Solomon. And I like that you personalize it and say you're a father. And I know you're a proud father. I know your wife. <laughs> and you're proud parents. Yeah. And I think that it's important for you to recognize that being a parent takes more than just biological parenting. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of intentionality to be a good parent. I am a mother of five biological children. My youngest is 17. Wow. And so I am a mother of young adults and adults. And I know it has not been a straightforward journey for me even to be a parent because we had to debunk um, a lot of myths a lot of misinformation, but to be open with our, par with our children. Uganda has a very young population. The average age of a Ugandan is 15.1 years. Wow. Which makes us a very young country. And if you look at the statistics, more than 70% of our population is less than 30 years of age. And this is a dependent population. And with dependency comes a lot of need, a lot of want, and a lot of uh, excitement. Mm -hmm. So as young people are growing up, we as parents need to guide them. But also, we need support from 
every single stakeholder. You referred to your grandmother, your mom, hopefully your uncle, you mentioned a koja who guided you. Um, I believe you grew up in the 80s and 90s as a young person, as a teenager. But we yeah. are now in the 21st century. A lot of people don't know who their aunties and uncles are. Today, we are looking at more nuclear families and the socialization that we experienced growing up in the 70s and 80s and 90s has reduced. And that's the fact of life. People are more busy. People are more into their own nuclear families. And even the Sengas who we hoped would be the ones to guide our children are busy with their own families, hustling. They call it Okoyiriba in the, the mm. local language. Mm. And people don't have time to have those, you know, family reunions and what have you. So um, children end up getting information from the television, from Google, from their friends, from their peers. And I have worked in this space for a long time. From the time I completed my Master's of Pediatrics over 20 years ago, I started to work in the adolescent space. And I've learned along the way, and these adolescents have taught me, that unless you are intentional about guiding them, about <laughs> showing them the truth, they are going to look for that information. Remember, adolescence does not care whether you, are, you have a senga or an uncle. You will keep growing, and that's the fact of life. And as the hormones keep surging in, and sexual characteristics come in, the inquisitivity will come. And it's not so much because these are Ugandans, but all over the world, adolescents are inquis they're inquisitive. They want to find out what's changing in my body. And they end up having peer pressure. But if you don't guide them well, they will end up getting into mis you know, mistakes. And some of them even getting pregnant. It's fascinating. Doc, as a mother, as an African woman, what did it take you to raise those girls? I have two beautiful girls. Uh, one is 19, one is 25. And they're very beautiful, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that. But because my husband and I have trusted them to make decisions, they've engaged with us right from the time they were eight. I remember our older daughter coming and telling us, She'd gone for swimming classes at the age of eight. And she came and told us, Mommy, there's a boy who came to the swimming pool with condoms at eight. And wow. we said to her, what, what happened? We were, we were panicking. And she was like, no, he just showed us the condoms. He said uh, his older brother had given them to him. And wow. that was it. That was the beginning of a conversation of don't let anybody touch you in the wrong place. Don't let anyone hang out with you in a secret place. Today, I'm very comfortable to say that I will say whatever conversation it is with my children. And I also remember my younger daughter starting her menstrual period. She was 11. She called me as I was driving to home. And she said, Mommy, you remember what we talked about? And I was like, mm -hmm, yes. And then she said, Mommy, I started my period. And I was like, eh, eh. Then I told her, let me call back. She called back imagine. immediately and she said, Mommy, I heard what you said. And she said, I, I said, what did I say? And she said, you said, eh, eh. And I'm like, yes, that's what I said. But can we have a good conversation when I get home? Yeah. Her biggest fear was what's going to happen? Is it going to be painful, the cramps? Because we had talked about all this. Yeah. She knew what to use. She knew what to say. And the next big step was, let's tell daddy about this. It took her a lot of courage to have an open conversation with daddy because daddy needs to also know that my girls have started their period because he will be the one to buy the sanitary towels for them in the event that I'm not at home. And it's important for parents to normalize growth and not only for girls, but also for boys. Wow. But my son, who is 17, should know that having wet dreams is not a disease, that it's part of growing up. It's yeah. the male part of the menstrual cycle. 
that getting wet dreams is absolutely normal. But that sex should not be something they should rush to do because it has consequences. I remember us growing up and we watched this movie called Consequences and it was really scary. Today they don't show consequences, they show other things. They even show statistics of girls dying because of an abortion. They show girls who have been killed in some cultures in this country. When a girl gets pregnant out of wedlock, they're thrown out of their home. They're even thrown down a mountain. But should that be the final solution? I don't think so. I think that we need to demystify the story of early sexual activity. We also need to demystify growing up. We need to empower parents to have the courage to talk about the birds and the bees. And I'm not talking about the Uganda crane here. I'm not talking about <laughs> real bees. I'm talking about the reality of growing up. That in our department of pediatrics, we've done various studies and, and seen the difference between um, the rural community and the urban or peri-urban community. Mm -hmm. During the COVID period, we did a study that was supported by the Research and Innovation Fund of Makere University. And we were looking at the rising number of pregnancies, particularly in the rural community. And we went to a, a village, a place called Kamuli, and we could not find a single girl who had not become pregnant. What? And we were looking at girls aged 14 to 24. But wow. every single family had a girl who had become pregnant, who was pregnant. And compared to Wakiso district, we did not find many girls who had become pregnant. For me, it showed me that apart from poverty, what you tell your child is going to determine how she responds to her menstrual period. Mm -hmm. We had sad stories where um, in Kamuli, the mothers would tell the girls, now that you've started your periods, who is going to buy your sanitary towels? And the girls would look for somebody to buy those sanitary towels. Sadly, it would end up being a border border rider, guy who is working on the sugarcane farm, and they'd end up pregnant. We know in this country, there are places like Butaleja where there are 27-year-old grandmothers. Yeah. We've seen girls as young as 10 becoming pregnant. We have data and statistics from Kawempe Hospital where 50% of the girls and of people who come to become mothers are less than 18 years. And so this goes on and on and on and on and in the last 10 years, nothing much has changed. One out of every four girls becomes pregnant before the age of 18 in this country. And COVID showed us that some parents are actually the perpetrators yeah. of the rising number of teenage pregnancies. I know we have a law in this country where um, there's a law on defilement and even a law on aggravated defilement. But as our colleagues from the Justice Law and Order Management System will tell you, the cases that have piled up, that have not been processed, include a lot of girls who have been defiled, molested, and they're not being cleared. Yeah. So what can we do as a country? What can we do as parents? We need to do our small part. For us as the Department of Pediatrics, we run a general adolescent clinic where we look at anticipatory guidance. And in this anticipatory guidance, we talk about the birds and the bees. We support parents to be open about talking about sex and sexuality. We encourage young people to delay the age of sexual activity. Look, let me just, let me just go to what you've just said. Being open as parents um, with our children about these things, um, like you've mentioned, before they would take you to a senga koja. Right now, it is us that have to do this. It is, you know, but there's this thing that it's, you know, it, it's a bit uncomfortable and immoral. I don't know to talk about sex and sexual, you know, issues with your children. How can you emphasize this with these parents that look, 
you're going to sit your son down you're going to sit your daughter down and say romani okuze this is how it is you this is a b c d e f g you've hinted on it and i wanted you to emphasize how important it is and i i think it it doesn't start like on your your child's 10th birthday you wake up and you call them and you're like mm-hmm. kati okuze let us start no it starts with building friendship it starts with building trust it starts with you playing with that baby when they are 6 months of age as a dad and you're throwing them in the air and they trust you it starts with your baby being 4 years old and asking you mommy where did i come from and that is the time you should start telling the truth i mean not telling a 4 year old that nakusindika uh, all that stuff but telling a baby that you came out of my womb and I gave birth to you. Sometimes parents lie and those lies they get you know placed on the hard disk of this child and when they they learn in primary 5 and 6 about reproduction they learn that you told them lies. They watch the cows giving birth. They watch the dogs giving birth and they see the chickens having their reproductive cycle. <laughs> And then you're busy lying to them that for you as adults you don't do it. They need to respect you for the truth that you tell them. And as they grow up, that conversation gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And I think that you cannot separate hygiene with growth uh-huh. and that the conversation can just be as simple as you're a girl, uh-huh. you're a boy. This is how we wipe Uh-huh. uh flash after you wash your hands conversations that are going to help this young child not only to become clean and hygienic but also responsible the more we teach our children responsibility and etiquette and manners the more they will trust us to be able to tell them and guide them in other words let us be present as parents For me if anything is taken away from this conversation it is that parents should be there for their children gone are the days when we are throwing the responsibility to other people gone are the days when we are expecting the senga to give that information the onus is upon us both parents not just one both it's important to emphasize that because normally them Uh, we the men just say oh mommy will take care of that go but, to mommy but you see mommy is not going to tell uh your son that you know what as you grow up the muscles are going to grow bigger hair is going to grow around your chest and our voices are going to break and boys want to mirror their fathers but if there's an absentee father then they are going to look for that father in someone else so if father is available and you know pouring his testosterone and power on this child in a good way then things will be easier yeah no i i think i thank you very much um dr sub for that L- let's talk about access to the products um you know access to these reproductive health products for young people this is a conversation that has been going on on should i you know give my 13 year old 14 year old 15 year old condoms um or should i take them for any reproductive measures this conversation has been going on uh with some largely saying that we are a christian nation and therefore we should only promote abstinence and that's it um no access to uh you know sexual productive health products for young people and that has gone on and on and on and on what do you what do you make of it as a mother mm. as a pediatrician but also as a youth adolescent expert well i'll compare the scandinavian countries to our country and for the longest time possible the scandinavian countries have had a very low teenage pregnancy rate because they offer information and where possible offer the tools that prevent pregnancy 
I do know that, yes. Um, That's interesting. Yes. In, yeah. And offering this information, it, it's related to knowledge is power. If you know that crossing a road before looking left and right is dangerous, you're going to look left and right, and then you will cross the road. But if no one has ever told you that, you're just going to cross the road and then you'll probably be slammed by a border border or a trailer or whatever. So an anticipatory guidance that I talked about before, it is important for the young people to even know that sex is not a bad thing. I think translated in many languages in Uganda, sex is bad manners. Yeah. MPCMB. Bad manners, MPCMB. MPCMB, you know. Uh -huh. But the truth is, sex is not MPCMB. Because <laughs> the truth is, we were all born out of an act of sex. sex. And the sooner we understand that it is a physiological process and it is not bad manners, then we will let our children know that it is a timed event that it should happen at the right time with the right person in the right place. And it, wow. should, it should not be rushed. And the consequences for me are the most important things that these young people should know. Just like I tell my teenage son, alcohol is not good for your brain. If you take alcohol before the age of 25, your brain is not going to go to its maximum. Similarly, if you indulge in sexual activity without protection, you may end up with a sexually transmitted infection, which is untreatable. You could get a girl pregnant and be arrested because defilement takes a toll on everyone. Like defilement below the age of 18, that couple is, you know, prone to a felony and they will be prosecuted technically. Oh. But if you become a father at 17, how are you going to finish school? What are the consequences? For me, I, I would like that the young people are responsible for the consequences. However, there are those young people who, honestly speaking, they don't have a choice. And many, many studies have been done to show that there are even commercial sex workers who are less than 18 years, oh. sadly. At our clinic, we have received a girl who was 10 years of age who had um, multiple STIs. We've also received a 14-year-old girl on our ward who had cervical cancer, and she'd been sexually molested from the age of five. My goodness. It's, it's painful, and it is sad, and it happens, sadly. But there should be protection, social protection, protection for those kids who are at risk of being abused. They should be taken out of that toxic environment. They should be protected from being continuously sexually molested. But do we have the social services? Also, we do know that for a fact, many young people before the age of 18 are indulging in sexual activity. 15% of girls in a study done by the Uganda Health and Demogra Demographic Health Survey showed that they were sexually active before the age of 18. Mm, and I've for the boys, it's about 14%. But who are they indulging with? Many times it is the older generation or people of the same age. And surely the worst case scenario is that one, this girl could get pregnant or secondly, she could get an STI. And pregnancy has its own consequences. Teenage pregnancy results in bad outcomes, prematurity, uh, ruptured uteri, and many other things, yeah. including abortions. And yeah. abortions are associated with a high mortality rate. Yeah. Dr. Sab, you, 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 we will get to the pregnancy bit just shortly. Hmm. Do you agree that young people need to get access to contraceptives and other products? Um, because like you've said, the numbers are clear. Young people are having sex. Sometimes it's their first time. I mean, you've talked about the instances in Kamuli where these young people gather in a trading center in the evening. It's their first time to have sex. They don't know what even to do, you know, and they just get pregnant. 
there've been people who are saying look the the fact is that young people are having sex it, the numbers are clear the teenage pregnancies are there the demographic health survey was very very clear and therefore we need to put youth friendly services or youth friendly centers where young people can freely have access to these products and that has left this country divided quite sharply interesting and I, I personally wouldn't dish out condoms to my child i trust that what i have told them is what they will believe in because i've i've emphasized anticipatory guidance there are individuals who are 17 years of age and they are having their third baby i have dealt with such individuals and on an individual basis i would then recommend contraception for that 17 year old because i would like this 17 year old to go back to school and achieve their fullest potential i have interacted with 15 year olds who have had one or two abortions and they are putting their lives at risk of losing their lives and so there's something called um assessment of the need for contraception mm-hmm. it is not right for us to give a blanket check like a blank check all of you go we have other priorities really and for me some of those priorities include offer free menstrual hygiene products for girls to tell you the truth if this country offered free hygiene products for girls the teenage pregnancy rates would slump they would definitely slump you don't know how many girls are out there afraid of the next period because they don't know what they are going to use they don't even know if they are going to go to class and then there are myths and myth- misconceptions that tell them that you know what if you have sexual relations the cramps will be less painful you block the period they call it period blocking and they end up having sexual relations and getting pregnant and then the parents have not been involved in this conversation and they go haywire and it's all a mess but if we all continue this conversation parents take on the responsibility to educate our children the government offer free hygiene products let us also look at each individual as they come the ideal situation would be that every single young person is in school but is that the reality it's not yeah i i hear you um interesting things that you you've been saying these young people get pregnant like you've mentioned many of them because they we've not talked to them because they don't know what's happening many of them get information from their peers so oh i'm pregnant i mean yes even in town here but most largely in the areas in the the rural areas they'll go to their peers and say look i i got i got pregnant um what can i do i fear to tell my parents what can i do and then they'll say ah oh, get detergent add nanda or you get them mama jani or nyue others get naive that they get sharp objects that they use um and then at the end of the day they perforate their uterus and you know it intensifies it's really get it really gets terrible um what do we tell our young people if we found out that they got trapped in such a place you know i think for me the best thing that a parent would do is accept that this has happened and move forward and you mentioned that because i imagine if your daughter in real time came to you and said i'm pregnant the african mother in you or the african parent in us would actually just get crazy shook. like shock yeah so how what, what how do you how would you prepare that parent to receive that news but also do what you're telling them to do accept and in reality i have dealt with many many parents i can't even count 
who have come and said my daughter is expecting a baby and you're like it's not the end of the world even just last week we saw um she's now a 20 year old who got pregnant when she was 17 story of being told to period block and this information was given to her by somebody in the school so she found a classmate who offered to period block for her and there she was with her baby the anger which the mom and the dad had towards this girl was like a world war 3 but because our clinic offers counseling services we were able to bring in the mom and the dad and the parents in law and as we speak now she's with her baby and she's gone back to school and this is just one case of many it's not the end of the world the likelihood of her becoming pregnant is high because in our culture there's also various myths and misconceptions umwana tino umuzako and all those uh, various other stories so what do you do for such a girl you need to bring them close parents you you fainted on it many many african parents would just beat them up and throw them out gende yakuwa dolo buto some even want to just kill leave me. go like, i'm no longer your parent in kweganyi you are shaming my family yeah you are shaming my family but what did you do before this happened were you watching were you explaining what could happen and i'm not blaming the parents sometimes it's rape some girls have been raped and sadly sexual violence happens a lot in this country and some of it is not even talked about i remember a former nanny of ours calling me all the way from rakai and her 12 year old daughter had been sexually molested and she was being taken around in circles to deal with the perpetrator thankfully i have friends in the justice law and order management system and they were able to intervene in time and help this poor mother but how many other mothers out there go away and they are taken around in circles paying the people who should bring them justice how many there are so many and this needs to be brought to a halt dr sab um thank you for taking us deep what do we do as parents as guardians in trying to manage this delicate stage of of, of young people well i i think the first thing is to wake up and smell the coffee stop putting our heads in the sand and be friends to our children the more we are friends to our children and i'm not saying be friends like muepene you know kauna that kind of friendship but let there be a conversation at the dinner table where you talk about um the birds and the bees give time to our children now they are going on holiday i think it's important for parents to sit down put time aside and be parents parents who are too busy to talk to their children will end up you know having shocks in their lives and also getting to know who your friend who your children's friends are because birds of a feather flock together and if your child is flocking with a girl who has had multiple sexual partners guess what your girl is going to be the next girl who has multiple sexual partners it takes a lot of resilience and training and trust for this kids to go they are exposed to a lot of challenges they exposed to a lot of um needs and wants and if you take a journey of a girl coming from a boarding a day school uh, she's exposed to a lot of whispers a lot of jangun kwe mere recently we saw a man a 50 plus year old man who had sexually molested an 8 year old and an 11 year old i don't know if you saw that story wow and this guy 
We should not call him anything else. He is a pedophile. For 300 shillings, he sexually molested these little girls. And there are so many others like this individual. And they need to be brought to book. I think that the community should not um, give up their responsibility. As a community, as Ugandans, we should watch out for such criminals. But also, I, I want to use the term that Buri Mbuzi, <laughs> like be like a mother chicken, be like a hawk, be like an eagle, care about your child. Get to know how they go to school. Get to know how they are moving from school to home. And then provide. I know a grand aunt who told her 10 year old, the one who came with multiple STIs in our clinic. She said these words. Uh, the grand aunt told her to cater for her dinner. And this poor girl in catering for her dinner should go and sell her body for sex. And lo and behold, the consequences were clear. She had multiple STIs. We don't know if she'll ever get completely cured because STIs are not just treated symptomatically. They can have dire consequences, including infertility later when she decides to have her own children. Wow. Sad story. Last one, Doc. Allow me to just ask you this. What we see mostly these days is parents who are buying for their children tabs. You know, they are buying them computers, laptops, they are buying them phones, they are connected to the internet, they are exposed. Uh, and those are the, 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 the rich, okay, so-called rich parents who now um, give all these things to their children and they don't even pay attention to what are they watching. What are they listening to? Um, is this a bad thing? Or should we just keep it fireplace as our our fathers, our forefathers did it? Interestingly, um, in our postgraduate class at Makere, we talk about um, social media and digital age and its impact on children. And the truth is, technology is not a bad thing. But we do know that there are people out there who will take advantage of children. There is now um, artificial intelligence that can identify that this is a child, and then the adverts will start slowly. And before you know it, your child is engaged in pornography. And pornography is addictive, and it actually affects the, the penile gland of an individual, as well as their psychosocial status. Pornography, if a person is addicted to it, can end up being like a drug. And before you know it, this child has started indulging in things that you wouldn't want to imagine. So parents should be cautious. And just like we've said in anticipatory guidance, do not overdo things. I think the Katikiro of Uganda recently said, Temobe um, kopi. Those were his words. That in loving your child, don't overdo things. There's no point in giving your child a tablet, an iPhone, um, I don't know what other gadgets, and think that you're going to replace your parenting skills with all these gadgets. Give the child a time to be a child and let them look at the stars. Let them go to the garden. Let them hear the stories of how you grew up, the little stories that you read from books so that they understand that life is not a beach. Wow. Um, fireside chats with our children. Let them go and um, take the goats to the greenery. Let them clean the house. Mm -hmm. These days we have uh, house managers and we don't even want our kids to go. And, and more. the more we don't teach our children resilience and hard work and understanding that they can survive on their own, the more we are hurting them. 
that if we do not teach them work, if we do not teach them hard life, not thug life, but hard life, then we are, we are making a mistake and losing the opportunity for them to actually become um, successful adults. I have a friend who told me that. He's like, mm -mm, we go, nebakola, they work in the farm, I pay them. If they don't, I tell them, I pay for you school fees. So they don't get things easy. And this is a rich man. He's doing the right thing. A very rich man who says, no, get out, go and feed the goats, go and feed the chicken, go. As long as children get to understand that it comes easy, mm -hmm. they are not going to work. Hard work pays. And for sure, you've seen it. If you don't work hard, you will suffer. But also, education is power. That as long as we don't keep our kids in school, so that they at least keep in school for at least 21 years, then we've lost an opportunity for them to grow their brain, but also to be resilient. And in future, people who are resilient are those who are going to survive. Like Darwin's theory has stated, it is survival for the fittest. You want your child to survive in this difficult world. If you think that you're going to provide for them, they will not have the skills to be able to cross the road. And if you're not there to help them cross that road, they will be hit by a vehicle. Yeah. Dr. Sabrina, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, sharing those thoughts with us, Dr. Sab. Any closing remarks? My closing remarks are first, thank you so much for this conversation. It's not going to stop here. Uganda, we are a young country. We have a lot of potential and we need to harness the over 17 million young people in our country because they are the future. As long as we do not support them to grow, to be healthy, they will not achieve their fullest potential. Thank you very much, Dr. Sabrina Chitaka. Dr. Sabrina is a celebrated pediatrician. She's also an adolescent medicine specialist and she's a lecturer as well. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Sabrina, for sharing your thoughts with us. I'm Solomon Serwanja and this is the Ahaki Podcast. <laughs> <laughs>